All right, welcome to week number nine. This is Antioch Baptist Bible Institute, and this class is on how to teach the Bible. We sure appreciate you joining us for the class. We are in a section on the systematic approach to teaching, and right now we're looking more at the area of topical teaching, and then next week we will get into uh, textual Bible teaching, meaning verse by verse, um, chapter by chapter, uh, book by book. We are going to, uh, in this evening's class, we're going to focus on the uh, geographical study on, you know, so how to study, teach geographic um, matters, uh, historical uh, whether it's uh, a, uh, an event or a, a period of time, and then also biographical, which means uh, dealing with a person. So we're, uh, like we said last week in the class, we are in somewhat of a, a, a dangerous section because when you're looking at the Bible topic by topic, meaning you're not spending a lot of time teaching, hopefully you are studying, but maybe not as much time teaching on the context, which means, say, the verses up above your passage and the verses down below your passage. When you're not uh, teaching the Bible from the standpoint of considering all the context, <clears throat> you, can, you can genuinely, I mean, you can generally make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And if the audience is not taking the time to research and study the scripture for themselves to see if those things that you're saying are correct in the context, then you can easily mislead people. And we, we certainly don't want to do that. But I, I'm just going to tell you, especially the more prominent the name of a preacher, and I, from what I gather, this is true in every camp or circle of Christianity, and it's true really just in the world in general, the more prominence that an individual has, the name, the name of the person has recognition, the name brings with it authority, maybe because of experience or because of a, um, a record of being uh, true or accurate with something. But the more that's true, the more a person can say something, not back it up with the text, and people will just believe it because that person said it and it must be so. Now, if we're going to be honest with the scriptures and if we're going to be honest before God and if we're going to be honest with the, uh, the audience, that's not how we want to do things. And so we, even if we're not teaching the context, we want to be honest with the context. We want to take the time to study it in our personal time and then there may be times where, in a topical study even, where we communicate the context, even though we may not be able to spend 30 minutes you know, developing the context. Again, this is why I'm so fearful when it comes to this type of study. Now, just to give you a little background, and then we'll, we'll move into the lesson, for the bulk of my, I got saved when I was 18 years old, for the bulk of my Christian life, Topical studies was all I really knew. We didn't, uh, the church I got saved in, some of the text might be preached, but uh, the, the bulk of the study was topical, and it was pretty much every service was a different topic that we would look at. Maybe a passage was included, but it, the focus would be on a, a particular topic. And it wasn't really till I came to the church where I am now that I started learning about uh, textual teaching and preaching. And then the Lord uh, allowed my path to cross with some other uh, preachers who majored even more so on that, and it really uh, helped me to see the benefit. So most Christians today, if you go to a church service, you go to a Sunday school lesson, whatever it may be, you're going to have a topical study and again, I'm not saying it's evil. I wouldn't even, if I thought this was sinful, I wouldn't take the time to, to talk on it. I think it is useful 
but I think that we need to make sure that we're guarding ourselves and we're just seeing ahead of time, okay, this can be dangerous for the, these reasons. I need to make sure I'm not, uh, you know, violating the context of the scripture in my teaching of a topic. We don't want to change the scripture just to be able to, to strengthen or teach our positions. If that's what we have to do, then we need to change our positions. Now, we, we look to start the class at, the, uh, at a geographical study. So I'm going to study a place, and I'm going to teach on this place. For example, Bethel. Uh, let's say I'm going to do a Bible study on the place known as Bethel, and I'm, I, I want to study it, but I'm also going to teach it. Why is this place prominent in Scripture? And what are the benefits of us learning about this place? How can this, a study of this place give me some practical and doctrinal truths in my life that will help me to be a better Christian? So the first thing, and we're going to break it down this way in each of these sections, is first possessing the knowledge. Okay, if I'm going to teach other people on a place, I have to first possess the knowledge of that place. So I'm going to find every occurrence of that place in Scripture. Where is it mentioned? Now, it's a little tricky because some places in the Bible have multiple spellings. It may be spelled one way in the Old Testament, a different way in the New Testament. It could be uh, two different names. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure Bethel is such a place in the Bible where it was once called by this name, and now it's called by this name, and maybe later it's called by a different name. And so if I'm studying this place, this location, then I need to know what are all the names for it. And so I may have to look up multiple names, multiple spellings. If there are name changes, I'm going to have to find out why are there name changes? What do the names mean? Uh, why was it changed from this to this? All that's information that I'm going to have to have if I'm going to be able to help uh, the students to see the benefit in studying this place. Uh, what kind of a place is it? Is it a, uh, a region, a city, town? Is it a mountain? Is it a body of water? You know, what is it? Uh, what are the major events that took place there that made it kind of uh, show up on the map, if you will? You realize, in, uh, and I, I don't agree with everything on the Bible maps. I, I think uh, several things are wrong, but I, I, even other things, I don't know how we prove where things were necessarily. But when you think about it, there are places mentioned in the Bible that don't necessarily show up on a map. In our, in our language, we would say something happened to put this town on the map. So what happened in that place to get it to show up on a, a, on a map? What made it prominent? Uh, what are the major events that happened there? What maybe, what started the town or the city? What what was the destruction of the city? And then uh, look at the spiritual condition of the place. If I'm trying to teach people today, living today, about Bethel, well, why? Maybe my purpose is simply just to uh, teach them about this place in the Bible. And I, I think that that's fair. I, maybe some people don't care as much about that, but I think just knowing the Bible is reason enough to study something. Maybe everybody doesn't feel that way. So if you're going to teach your audience about a place, you're going to have to give them some reasons to believe that it's important for them to study. So what are the worship practices that are connected to the place? Um, were it, was it godly or was it pagan? Or was it both? And when did it shift from one to the other? Did people in the place have knowledge of, of God, the true God, the one true and living God? Uh, what is the name of the major deity connected to this place? I've always found those studies to be interesting. And not only that, but what about the major people or people groups? Uh, you know, who lived there? Did that change throughout Scripture? Is that a place known for, for giants uh, or other supernatural beings? You know, did did Abraham live there? Did Isaac live there? So on and so forth. Uh, who dwells there now in the present time? 
and then learn the features of the place. Are there any landmarks? You know, what mountains, bodies of water, valleys, all those things, what stand out? Is it a de desert place? Is it a wilderness? Uh, what's grown there? I've always been uh, intrigued. I've really never had the time to just dive in and do it. But the Cedars of Lebanon, you're going to read about the Cedars of Lebanon. And I believe, um, I believe there are some prophetic statements made about um, the man of sin identifying him with a cedar of Lebanon. So what's, what is this? What are the cedars of Lebanon? Why are the Lebanon, uh, the, and then the bulls of Bashan? That's interesting. What, what's going on in that place? And, uh, what, you know, is there a weather thing there? I mean, all those things just, just as a, as a Bible student, I, I want you to think about it this way. Okay. From time to time, we'll see a, a detective, a, a, a captain of a police force or something come forward and, and hold a press conference. And he, he will tell, uh, you know, of a crime that has been committed. Okay, such and such crime has been committed. Our team is investigating the crime. We've looked at the scene of the crime. We're gathering information. As soon as we get more information, we will report that to you. And then later on, another press conference will come and the, the captain or chief of police will come forward and say, all right, this was our findings and uh, here's what we're going to report unto you. In many ways, a Bible student is the investigation team, okay? You're going in, you're, you're, everything around you is evidence in the scripture. It's potential, okay? I need to, oh, that may be important. I need to consider that. I'm studying this place. Well, why is, you know, the, the location of this place, why is that important? Okay, these people live there. Why is that important? Okay, this mountain is there. Why is that? Everything, you have to be willing to say everything is potential evidence or important information in order for me to understand this place. Now, when it comes time to come to the press conference and step up to the microphone and give the report, some of the things that you investigated turned out to not be crucial for the masses, okay? Everybody doesn't need to know that I learned that this river flows through it. But there is information that I'm going to give in my teaching that this is important information for you to know if you want to really get a good understanding of this place. And so I, I hope that that earthly illustration will help you to understand the, the spiritual work of studying and then teaching the Bible. Now, once I've, I've spent hours on my study, and again, we say this, we've, it seems like we've said this each week, we're going to say it again the next couple weeks at least, you, it's going to be hard work doing this. You cannot spend... 15 minutes on a geographical study and have enough information to teach people what they need to know. Now, look, through the years, I have saved most of, if not all of my notes from my studies. And sometimes notes that I have studied in the beginning or maybe 10 years ago, I can pull those back up and they can help me in the present. Sometimes I look back at old notes and I say, my goodness, what was, what was I thinking on those notes? Those are of no help at all. And even now, it, I mean, I've been doing this now a little bit of time, and even now I still have to spend hours upon hours in preparation for one sermon, one lesson. Um, it, 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 does not come, it does not come quick, not if you're going to do a good job, not if you're going to do your best for the Lord. And so once I've spent hours studying this, this place, and if I, if I studied it for 30 minutes and I found I don't have any more information, then it's probably not worthy of a lesson specifically devoted to this place. I might still make notes and say, okay, at some point, these notes will help me in a larger study, but as far as by itself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach on this place. But now once I've got, I've got all my, you know, I've studied it out. I've printed out my, 
uh, my Bible verses, all those things. Now I'm going to develop my outline. And again, we're not going to spend time again talking about the outline. Anytime I say develop your outline, you go back to our previous study and say, okay, how would I now implement these, these principles in outlining in my, you know, my study of this place? And now I'm going to pass the information, okay? If the focus of a study or lesson is on that of a place, which is the subject matter we're talking about, then much effort will have to be given to ensure that that place remains in focus. It is going to be difficult at times. If you're teaching on a place and you come across, okay, Abraham lived there. You can't if, if your focus is on the place and you come to the name Abraham and now you spend 30 minutes on Abraham, by the time you get back to the place, you've lost the emphasis on the place. You've lost the, the flow. And now people are, Abraham is so much in mind that I've forgotten that we're actually studying the place. Now, again, if, if you're doing a textual study, sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're just flowing through the text, some of that's okay, you're in the text. But if your focus is on a place, which I think is, you know, it's a good study. I can't leave the place to go talk about all these other things and then come back and expect my audience to follow that. You have to remember People have extremely short attention spans. And if I take people away from my subject for 10, well, 5, 10 minutes even, and bring them back, they are going to struggle to come back. I try to explain this to people just in general in life. If I'm working on a project, okay, and somebody says, hey, I need you for, let's say, 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm working on it. I'm doing a study on a, you know, whatever, a Bible topic. And somebody says, I need you for 10 minutes. The reality is I'm not going to lose 10 minutes. I'm going to lose 30 minutes. And part of that you say, well, why, why do you mean that? Well, because my mind has to shift from the thing that I'm doing to this other thing. I'm not bothered. I'm not mad. I'm not upset. That's all that's fine. I understand you can't just sit down and just 100% focus on anything for, you know, eight, 10 hours straight. You can't do it. But by the time, okay, so now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to help with this. By the time my mind is able to come back to where I was, I've probably lost. It was a 10 minute project. No big deal, right? but I've probably lost 30 minutes, which is three times the amount of time. And, and the reason why that is, is because we struggle in our minds to stay on focus, okay? And once we move the focus, getting back to focus is really difficult. That's why I'm telling you all this. If I'm teaching on a place and I move away from the place to go to something else, and then I come back and I think, oh, people are right back with me. No, they're still over here. It will take them minutes, if they're able, to come back to what you initially wanted to talk about. So that's why it's so important. You've got to stay on topic. Now, uh, people, the, the, the age in which it's going on, verse by verse studies, word or phrase studies, and other such things cannot overpower the place. So I can't get lost in these. Other, all those things are important. But in my study at that moment, they are not the most important. We also need to consider the overall theme or message presented by the place. So if I'm studying a place in the scripture, what's the overall theme of this place? Does, does it kind of tie together throughout scripture that this place was a place known for loving the Lord, or this place was known for its pagan worship. What, what, what does this place stand out for? What is the theme uh, of this place, of this location? And then when I'm thinking about how I'm going to teach it, what is my purpose? If I don't know what it is, the audience is not going to know what it is. 
So let's say I, I study this place and I say, okay, this place at one point was a God-fearing, God-loving place, but it slowly departed uh, from such uh, loyalties. Okay, well, that's, that, that gives me an idea that something happened in this place that shifted it from being this kind of a place to being this kind of a place. And I can teach that with a purpose of showing people uh, if, if you're not careful in your location, here are the things that can take place to shift from this kind of a city to this kind of a city, so on and so forth. I, I'm just giving you a for example. So consider the overall theme or message presented by this place and how it will prove both doctrinally and practically resourceful to your audience. Uh, identify to the audience the historical or prophetic importance of this place. W what made this place important? Why do we care about this place? Why should the audience care about this place? Why should the audience want to dive in and take note of this place as they are reading and studying the scripture? And then you've got to strive to help the audience visit the place in their minds as the lesson is being taught. I understand, and, and, and rightfully so, that the scripture uses the word imagination in a very uh, negative way, okay? The idea of an imagination, things that we create in our minds and hearts that are... Uh, false. I get that. But Christ is the image of the Father, okay? So we got to be really, really careful on how we're using these things. When I say to you that I think as you're teaching on a place, it, the, the best, and, and this is true in every study, the best you can get people to step into the passage we're studying this place, okay, right over to our, you know, to, to the east of us over here is, uh, is a, uh, and, and maybe from your standpoint, it's the opposite direction, but uh, over here on this side of us is this mountain range, and it's, you know, it's so, so many feet high, and over here is this body of water. The, the more you can get people there and walk them through the scene. Okay, if you look over here, this is pagan worship taking place. They're offering their children uh, to, to idols. And the more you can get the audience to step into the place, you don't necessarily have to, okay, if, if the Bible talks about this place, you know, is known for, you know, wheat or whatever. I'm just throwing that out. Okay, over here we can see some wheat fields and, uh, and, and we see people out here working. The more you can tell the story, not departing, not making stuff up. Please do not, do not make stuff up. Walk people, th have, you know, have the scripture as your authority, but walk people through the place. If you're able to, you might even show some pictures of the place. If you're able to do that without, you know, drawing out time on that. Uh, show it on a map, maybe. Explain uh, the, the lay of the land. Explain where it's located. What, if these things are of no importance, don't mention them. But if they are of importance and they help tell the story of the place, then by all means, take the audience on a, on a journey. Walk them to that place. Over here is where Jesus did this in his earthly ministry. Over here is where... Uh, the apostles first went forth and, and preached. Help people to step into the passage and see the place. Now, what about historical? Let, let's consider for, for a few minutes the study of an event. Okay, the study of an event. And again, many of these things overlap. And I'm, tr I'm trying my best not to be too repetitive, and I'm trying to be more specific to each each item, but sometimes that's a little difficult to do. But let's talk about an event for a minute. First, we possess the knowledge. Okay, I'm going to find all accounts of the event. Sometimes the event's found primarily in one place of the scripture. Maybe it's in the book of Genesis, but 
It's talked about somewhere else in the scripture as well. Maybe Jesus mentioned it in the New Testament. Maybe uh, the book of Hebrews, a lot of times it will tie in much of the Old Testament uh, in its uh, references. Maybe in the book of Acts, it's mentioned, uh, you know, as having happened. So I've got, I've got to take in every account of this event. If I'm studying something in the Gospels, I, I have to look for it in every Gospel. I might have to look for it in the Old Testament. Was it prophesied in the Old Testament that it would come to pass in the New, in the New Testament? Is it mentioned somewhere else in the New Testament, maybe in the epistles? But I have to look at all the accounts, especially when you're studying the Gospels, because there are times where one Gospel might tell of one man being healed, another Gospel tells of another man being healed, and if we're not careful, we think, well, that's the same man. But when you look at yet another Gospel, it tells you there were two. And you, you have to take all those things into consideration. Of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered synoptic Gospels, meaning a lot of times they are, there are similarities that tie those three together more so than the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has a different purpose. It's still one of the four Gospels, but it is handled and written and approached different from the synoptic Gospels. So I'm going to have to look at every place where I can find that event. Um, uh, consider all the details of the event. What are the individual uh, details? What do some details seem to contradict other details? Like I just mentioned, well, this one tells of this one man that was healed, but this happened. But then over here in this passage, it tells of a man that was healed and this happened. Well, why, why is that different? Well, maybe because there were two. Uh, maybe the feeding of 4,000 versus the feeding of 5,000. If you're, if you're a Bible believer, you understand I'm to believe the scripture. So I'm not going to change and modify details because I think, oh, well, the number was just wrong. It's the same event. The number's just wrong. No, you got to be careful with that stuff. So I'm going to, uh, if, if the details seem, and I'm, I emphasize that word, seem to contradict each other. First of all, I know they don't. I know there is no contradiction in Scripture. If there is a contradiction, and by that I mean, in my mind, these details don't line up. In fact, they contrast. They're, they're, they're not the same. If, I, if I'm thinking that, there's a contradiction up here in my mind. I've got to figure out what's going on with this. What, what am I missing what detail is going to unlock this whole thing so that I can figure it out? I know the Bible is right. I know that. That's not in my. That's not a question on the table for me. So I, I've got to study these things out and figure it out. Uh, what's the nature of the event? Is it a war, a wedding, a meeting, worship service? Is it God providing and blessing, or is it uh, God judging? What's going on in that event? And sometimes multiple of those things will will happen at the same time. For example, the, the, the flood. Well, that's God's provisions and blessings on Noah and his family, but it's God's judgment on the world. Again, if I'm studying the flood, okay, not only in the book of Genesis, but I've got other places in the scripture that are going to mention the flood. I've got New Testament passages that are going to talk about it, and I'm going to have to consider those in my study. Uh, consider all the people associated with this event. Uh, for the example, the flood. Noah was there. His children were there. Those are prominent people. Uh, you might even study, uh, I think it's Mephibosheth, and, and not Mephibosheth, Methuselah, and what happened with Methuselah in regards to the, um, uh, to the, you know, the flood. What about Enoch? Uh, all those things, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to study these people that are associated with the event. Uh, what are the places associated with the event? Do they have any importance or meaning in that in this study? Is it a place commonly associated with this type of an, of an event? I, I need to know those things. Uh, what's the time associated with it? When did it happen? How long did it last? What, what were the months? All that again, remember, you're the detective. I'm considering everything. But everything's not going to be turn out to be, you know, evidence that's going to solidify this, you know, this study. So what's the what's the time? Does it have any significance or impact in in uh, any way uh, the event being studied? Okay, so I, I want to 
I want to know all these things. I want to gather all this information. What's the prophetic implications associated with the event? For example, what's uh, in Noah's days, the flood? How does that prophetic? We know it's a historical event. We understand that God did something in the past. We're not belittling the fact that this is a literal historical event, but how does this also look forward to the future and what's the prophetic implications of the event? Now, uh, once we, we've gathered this information, we're going to develop our outline. Again, just like we've talked about in previous times, we can go back and look at our notes on outlining and, and get some principles there to help us. Now, what about passing the knowledge? I've, got, uh, I've studied, I've poured in hours upon hours in my study. What about now? As with every study that turns into a lesson, a purpose for teaching on the event should be established and effort should be made to present this purpose. Why am I teaching on the flood? Well, to me, there are many reasons to teach on the flood. And maybe my lesson is the 10 reasons why you need to know about the flood. Maybe that's, that, that's it. And maybe, okay, number one, uh, you need to know about the flood because it answers the, the, the conflict of scientific dating with creation, okay? We understand that, that, that God created the earth. He, it was, it's not uh, billions of years old. We understand these things scientists date things and they say, well, this is this old because of where we found it. But the flood will answer some of that because the flood so turned things upside down on this earth, a worldwide flood, okay? Not one location. I mean, a worldwide massive flood turned this thing upside down. And there is no doubt that it messed with and I'm not saying some of these scientists are not just outright lying or making stuff up. I'm sure some of them are. But it, it, you, you can't panic if, if, you, if they come out and they say, this is 100% true and we've validated this. It doesn't matter to me because even if there are old, even if there are seemingly old fossils because of how you found them and where you found them, you have to understand that God turned this thing upside down with a flood. So that is a reason. Now, if I'm teaching that, you understand I can't spend a lot of time, if I've got 10 reasons why you should study the flood, I can't spend, you know, unless I'm doing a series, I can't spend 30 minutes on that one. It has to be high level, hit this, move on. All right? So if I'm gonna study an event, I have to, okay, what's, what's the purpose? Why am I teaching this? And why do I need to educate the audience on the importance of knowing this? This is important to you because. And then once, I, once I've got that purpose in my mind, remember we have to have a purpose before we can present the purpose. Once I have it, I've got to make sure I communicate that throughout my, my study. Now again, context, people, places, time, other things, We'll work together to create the event, but we can't, if I'm teaching on 10 reasons why you should study the flood, I can't spend a lot of time on, on Noah. I can't spend much time at all on Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, it's a, those are great studies, but my study is something different entirely. So I can't spend time on these other people. I can't spend time on these other situations my focus has to be on the event itself. Now, if the event is covered in multiple passages across multiple books of the Bible, I have to be careful not to spend all my time and attention uh, turning to each passage. So if my event is covered, let's say, for example, I'm teaching on an event in the Gospels. If, I, if it's really important to me that everybody have all the passages, Okay, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you an idea that that might would help me. If it's if I my let's say my my event took place in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, then I and I need people to see every one of these passages. 
then one of the things I might would do is, it, let's say I've got a, 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 the possibility of putting something up on a screen. I'm gonna put all these passages side by side on a screen. Let's say I don't have that option. Okay, maybe I'm gonna put the passages side by side on a, a marker board, a dry erase board or a chalkboard. Let's say I, that's not a possibility. Okay, well, I'm gonna print off the passages side by side and I'm gonna hand them out to the, to the students so that they can see them and they can mark things as we're going through. If it is important, and, and look, sometimes it's gonna be extremely important, but if I'm having people, okay, turn to this one, now 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 turn to this one, the, the more I do that, the more, remember, people have short attention spans. And it's really difficult to keep the attention of people if you're moving them, you know, everywhere. And I, I hate even saying these things because in my heart, I know the Bible is the most important thing that we've got to say. And I'm trying to tell you, find other ways to get that, that those Bible verses to them because the more we're moving people and the more we're, okay, we were studying this, now we're moving over here and studying this, now we're coming back to this. The more we do that, people can't follow. So if I need to, maybe I should just print the verses and, and have them available for people and they can underline and maybe I can encourage them. Okay, now underline this in the Matthew passage and then do you see it here in the Mark passage? But they're not, they're not moving around. And again, I hate this. I, I hate that. I hate saying it. I hate thinking it. I hate that we're in a in an environment where we have such short attention spans. I wish we we you know we had hours and hours of attention span and we were all able to focus. But but you're sitting here taking a Bible Institute class. You love the Lord. If if you're taking this right on the heels of the other one, you're struggling. You're struggling. And you love the Lord and you're trying and you're 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 doing your best. Maybe you're throwing water on your face to try to stay awake. You're maybe you're taking sips of some, you know, of water or whatever. You're trying to you're trying your best to stay focused, but it is extremely difficult because we don't have long attention spans and we're really not doing anything to train our attention span to be longer. And so it's extremely difficult. I'm learning more and more. And, uh, you know, uh, just pray that God gives me wisdom on all this. But one of the greatest unreached mission fields in our world today is, uh, is uh, social media type stuff in short snippets. Because that, that is what, that's where people are getting all their information. And we can sit here and rebuke people for it. And it's, it's a rebukable offense. If all you can handle is 15 seconds of information before you shut down, that's pretty, that's pretty bad. Okay, and we can sit here and rebuke it. But that's not the way we, the, historically, the way we would handle stuff if we said, okay, I'm gonna go over here to this, this country and be a missionary. These people are pagan people. They're sacrificing their children. We would say, but I'm going and I'm gonna reach them where they are. What we do with social media stuff is we say these this stuff's garbage. The, this the the people have an attention span. It's it's terrible. It's junk. It's awful. It's sinful. We're not going to do anything with it. And I get it. But if you want to reach teenagers and you want to reach young people, you're going to have to go in order to re, you don't have to change your message. You don't have to change who you are. But you do have to go to where they are. They're not just going to show up at church excited to hear a 45-minute sermon. They're not excited about anything that lasts 45 minutes unless it's a concert, and even there, they're struggling with their attention. So we're gonna, we, we have to stay on task we, we, because the attention span can't handle it. So if you need to get the verses in front of them, get the verses in front of them, but you're, you can't shift them everywhere and expect that they're gonna be with you. Now, if, if an event speaks to a larger study on customs and manners, okay, this is the way, you know, a wedding, for example, this is the way a wedding was done, uh, then let the audience know that, hey, I'm teaching on this, but if you're studying this other thing, this information will come in handy for your other studies. So 
up to this point in, in this class, we've looked at geographical. Okay, I'm going to study a place. Uh, I want to you know, learn everything I can about this place, and then I'm going to teach on it to my audience or preach on it even. Uh, and then we've looked at the study of an event. This is under the, the heading of historical. When we come back from our break, the next study will also be under the, the heading of historical. But this is looking at an event. Okay, if I'm studying an event, what happened? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Where did it happen? When did it happen? What's in it for us? Why should I care to study this event? And, and then why should other people care to study this event? Why should other people care about the information relating to this event? So I'm gonna spend time on that to make sure my audience uh, can comprehend why we're spending the time on it. All right, so let's, let's take a break. Again, on the video, it will be a short break, but you can pause it and take however long you need to take and then come back uh, to the next part. When we get back, we're gonna study, uh, talk about the study of a period of time, which means we're gonna talk about how we possess that information and then how we pass it on to others. And then we're gonna look at the study of a person, how I possess that information and then how I pass it on to others. So take your break and we'll see you back here uh, shortly. All right, welcome back to class. We sure appreciate you being with us. We are now going to talk about uh, if, a, if we're teaching a topical study on a, a period of time, and you may wonder why, why would I teach a topical study on a period of time, but the, it really is a great approach to scripture and to people's understanding to know what was going on during a certain period of time within the, the greater co context of the Bible. Probably the most common would be uh, uh, people might study the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and that's a, we'll say, 32 to 33, uh, around that area, uh, ballpark of time. A another one would be some people might study uh, in the Bible, they might study the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's a you know a thousand-year period of time, obviously. Uh, some people might study the seven-year period of tribulation on this earth, known as Daniel's seventieth week. Uh, some people might study um, other ages in Scripture, try to get a consideration, for example, of what's going on during the four hundred years of silence between the Testaments. And so there are various reasons why you might study, uh, you know, a certain period of time. And when you're, when you're going to study that, you want to know kind of the broadness. How broad am I making this? Am I studying a thousand years or am I studying 30, a little bit over 30 years? Uh, you, you have to think through those things. Am I, you know, what's the period of time that I'm looking at? If I'm doing this, then I, I need to know what's going on in different places during this time. You know, what's the world, what's, what's happening in all the world at this particular time in history? I need to probably identify the major people or, or people groups, uh, maybe places that were prominent during those, th that time, what events took place, what was the, basically the spiritual condition of the world or of this, you know, these different places in the world and then uh, what are the, the uh, de other details that highlight the period of time I'm studying? And let's kind of break this down a little bit. As far as the persons, the, the people or people groups, uh, where, is it a, a Gentile prominence or is it a Jewish prominence? What, like what's going on as far as the people? Uh, who's, the, uh, who's God's primary messenger during this period of time or, did, or was there not one? For example, the 400 years of silence, it seems like there's nothing uh, prominent to report. I know that sounds strange, you know, but God God was silent as far as no prophets, no books of the Bible, all those kind of things. Uh, who's the primary person or people group of God's dealings? Who's he dealing with? Uh, then uh, consider the places of prominence in this period. What region of the world or place within a region was the focus? 
and that's, re I mean, if you can learn some of these things, it is really intriguing, especially in the life of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. If you can kind of see where all, where all that came from and the travels and all, man, it's, it is really, really interesting to, to read and to understand. I mean, God brought Abraham out of an idolatrous place. And so if you're, can, if you're studying, for example, you know, that period of time in which Abraham lived, now we'll talk a little bit later about if you're just studying the life of Abraham, but if you're studying kind of that period of time, it's, it's intriguing. It really is intriguing. So what was the focus? Was it, uh, was it in Israel, which, you know, was before Canaan? Uh, is it in Egypt? Is it um, in Mesopotamia, where, where's the focus during that period of time? And uh, did, did the prominent shift, okay, if I'm studying this period of time, well, at the first of this period of time, this area was prominent, but then it shifted to this area over here. Um, I think that happens in the book of Acts. So if I'm studying that apostolic age, uh, maybe that, that first 100 years or whatever, uh, I think that that happens there. What are the major events in this period of time? Okay, so what, what major events took place? How long did they last? What brought about the events and made them come to a close? So what started it and then ended it? What transitioned it? And then uh, what, uh, what major religious practices were going on? Who was, you know, what are the deities being worshiped? What were the practices demonstrating this worship? All these things are important. How do these practices impact the age that I'm studying? And then were there particular blessings or judgments brought on as a result? So if I'm studying, remember, we're looking at a, a period of time. Okay, my focus is on uh, the seven-year period known as the tribulation, or my focus is on the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth, or my focus is on the apostolic age, which really from the probably from, you know, the the, the Christ at, at 30 years old to, you know, we'll say the first 100 years after uh, Christ's resurrection and ascension, whatever it is I'm studying, I'm going to have to dig into these, you know, I'm, I'm focused more on what's going on in this whole period of time. My, my study is not necessarily relegated to a place not necessarily specifically to a person, not necessarily specific to uh, an event. I'm looking at from, from year, I'm just throwing it from year 1000 BC to you know year 900 BC, that 100 year period of time. That encompasses a lot of places, that encompasses a lot of people, that encompasses uh, events. What all was going on in the world? We're doing a historical study. We're going to walk to this age, and we're going to examine history. We're going to step into it, okay? So that's, that's I'm, I'm taking all this information in, and this is going to be um, very likely, this is a really difficult study. So where I've told you a textual study, let's say I'm studying 16 verses for, you know, uh, uh, the book of Psalms, Let's say I'm looking at probably eight hours, 10 hours, something like that of study. This is far greater than that. You're not in one place. You're all over the place. You may have to be in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. You may have to be in other, you know, historical books of the Old Testament. You may, I mean, you're going to be in all sorts of different places trying to gather information. So this is, this is a difficult study. You may be in the prophets, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be easy. And then you're going to need to identify the, uh, the larger role that that age, that period of time plays in God's plan overall. Okay. If I was saying, for example, the approximately 32, 33 years of Christ's earthly ministry, how does that age, that period of time that I'm looking at, how does that impact the larger part of God's prophetic plan. God's, uh, did God talk about it in the Old Testament? Does God talk about it into eternity future? That, that's a big study. 
and you can see how that, you know, that's going to consume quite a bit of your time uh, to do that. Now, once we've gather all of our information. Remember, we're the detective. I'm the investigator. I'm going in. Okay, that might be evidence. We're going to hold on to it just in case. That might be evidence. I'm going to hold on to it just in case. Once I've done that, I'm going to develop my outline. I'm going to try to, you know, put things together. Okay, and remember, you're going to have to have a purpose and a theme and all these things. You know, why is this important to the, to the audience? But in this type of a study, you're going to have to walk the audience through the people, the places, the events, as though you're telling a historical account. And I'm trying to think how to say this in a way that I'll, I'll be okay with, with saying it. There are men that get up to teach or preach the Bible and they are great storytellers. And by storytellers, I, I mean, in, in, in the context of which I'm thinking, they can get up and tell you a story about, I went to the store and I bumped into such and such, and man, they can have you sitting on the edge of your seat with just them telling you an illustration or a story. And that, to me, the ability to tell a story is a, is a gift or a curse. If the ability to tell a story outside of the scripture, outside of the context of a passage, outside of the historical account of the scripture. If, if somebody has that ability and they, they give that prominence above the text, that's a curse. But if you have the ability to tell the story of the life of Jesus Christ, bringing in the context in your storytelling, bringing in the scripture in your storytelling, bringing in the, the facts and the truths of the Bible in your telling of the story, and you're able to captivate an audience and hold their attention because of the way you communicate the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, for example, that is a great gift. And not many men have that gift, and those who have the gift or the ability to do so often use it in the wrong way. They use it to tell earthly stories about, you know, jokes or, you know, just life scenarios versus doing that within the confines of the scripture. And I, I wish I had that ability. That is an incredible gift from God. And I, I wish those men who have that ability would, would use it within the boundaries of the scripture. And in, if you're going to study a seven-year period of time or a thousand-year period of time, walking people through the events and the places, okay, this nation is, is doing this, this nation is doing this, this over here is going on, and you're able to walk people through it so that they can see it. It comes to life before them. I think some of the greatest Bible teaching, and we're going to get to this in, I think, about three weeks, if I'm remembering correctly. Some of the greatest Bible teaching that you read in Scripture, you're reading it on the pages of God's Word. If you would have been sitting there when it was happening, the Lord Jesus Christ, for example, was one of the greatest. And when I say this, I hope you'll be gracious and you'll understand the context in which I'm saying it. But the Lord Jesus Christ was one of the greatest storytellers one of the greatest, phenomenal storyteller. Some of the prophets, great, great storytellers. I mean, they could, they brought in visuals and they, they gave you illustrations and they, you could see it unfolding. And even if you're not sitting there watching, if Jesus says a sower went forth to sow, even if there's not a sower over there in, within their eye shot sowing, the way he's telling it, they can all see it. They've stepped into it. They're watching it unfold before their eyes because the Lord Jesus Christ had such a great gift of walking people through those those things. I, I, I would to God. I, I mean, I, I wish I had that event to do that. I mean, not, not, that, not, not that event, that gift to do that. 
uh, that would be such a, a blessing. But, you know, the Lord gifts us in different ways, and, and you thank the Lord for whatever gifts and abilities he gives you. But if you have that ability or that gift, use it for the glory of God. Please don't misuse that. Please use it for the glory of God. Uh, walk people through the, the, the event. Walk them through the time period. Walk them through the lives of the people. Uh, walk them through the place or the event. Just take them through it. If you're teaching on a, a period of time, you also have to work hard to find a theme or a purpose. What? Why would I even care to learn about this 100-year period of time? What, why, how does it, what does it matter to me? Remember, people typically don't care about things that don't have any kind of bearing or impact on their lives. So you have to help people to see the Bible is not an archaic book. It is very relevant to where we live today. But you have to help people see that. Everybody in the world is told that the Bible is an outdated, archaic, historical book. In fact, some, some uh, recently, uh, a, I don't know whether it was a, a nursing home, a retirement home, what it was, but they were doing Bible studies, and they said, you, you can't say Bible study anymore. You have to say, I think it was a, a, an ancient or historical book study. And that seems so small, but it's, it's not small. It's a, it's a brainwashing. It's getting into the minds and hearts of people and convincing them this is not an authoritative book. This is an archaic book. It is an ancient book. It is a historical book, which means it has no bearing on the present or on the future. But we know that's not true about the Bible. The problem is... Sometimes when we're teaching the Bible, that's the way we present it. This is a historical period of time. It really doesn't impact you, but we're just going to learn about it. Now, to me, I'm still willing to do that. I'm still willing to learn about that because I understand that the Bible always has an impact on me. But for my audience, I have to help them see why are we going to go 2,000 years back in time? Why are we going to go 3,000 years back in time? And, and how is that going to help you where you live today? So if I'm taking, a, I'm studying a period of time, people need to know why does it matter to me? How is this going to help me? How is this going to change my life? So if I'm the student in the beginning, I'm studying, I'm learning, I'm growing. Okay, I'm figuring things out. What would be my theme? Why would this matter to my audience? What's the purpose? What am I going to try to communicate as the purpose? You know, what do I want them to do with this? What do I want them to learn from this? How do I want their involvement in this study to impact their lives today? Okay, and, and as I've got here on the bottom of page 33, much effort should be given to show the relevance of the age. I can't say that enough. The Bible is relevant. And, and maybe, I should, maybe I should use another word here. When we say relevant, basically here's what we're saying. People in the world believe the Bible doesn't have anything to say to them or about them or for them. They just believe it's just an old book that if you just have extra time and you want to, you can go study and, and figure out the way some things used to be and the way some people used to think and the way some people used to feel. So they would say it's a historical book, meaning it, it had importance at some point in, in the past, but right now it's not presently important in my life. In fact, people would believe that the news is relevant meaning that's important to me right now because it's where I live. That impacts me right now because they're voting on this or they're passing this law or they're changing this law or they're doing this. That impacts me today. They, th that would mean that's relevant to my life because it impacts me today where I am. The Bible is a relevant book. From eternity past to eternity future, it is relevant. In every age, in every country, in every person's life, whatever the event, whatever the time, all that, it has 
application in my life in the present. Okay? It is relevant, but I have to teach it as though it is relevant. I have to show people its relevance. Remember, they've been convinced it's an ancient book. It's a historical book. It was just the way some people believed. It was just the way some people felt. No big deal. It doesn't apply to me today, but it does. In fact, if you, if you don't do what it says concerning believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, then this book's telling you you're going to go to hell and eventually to the lake of fire. That's very much impactful on your life in the present and forever. So the Bible is relevant, but we have to teach it as being relevant. We can't, we can't act like if we're going to study 2,000 years ago, we're just doing it just because we don't have anything else to do with our lives, but it doesn't have any impact on you today. It very much has impact. We can go back to the earliest chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and we can see that what God did in Genesis chapter 1 has impacted us now and really forever. So if all the way through, you have a relevant Bible, but you have to help people see its relevance when you're teaching it. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you'll study the Bible and you'll study something just because you have fun studying it and you don't have to, you don't have to understand why it's important in the bigger scheme of things. You just like learning the Bible. But that's not most people. And if you're one of those people who loves it, you've got to help other people come to that place. Now, lastly, we see a biographical study, which is a study of a person, okay? Again, we start with possessing the knowledge. What information do I need to take in if I'm going to study a person for the sake of, or eventually it might turn into a lesson on uh, that person. So I'm going to identify the name or uh, title of the person. Now, again, this is one of those things where spelling could be different. If I'm studying the person, the Old Testament versus New Testament, most likely the spelling is going to be different. Uh, sometimes uh, people have more than one name, Simon, which is Peter, which is Cephas, three names. Uh, the, Moses' father-in-law, I think it's Jethro, and maybe uh, maybe Hobab, and I can't remember, uh, Raul, maybe. I can't remember. Uh, but he has three names. Uh, the, there are people in Scripture that have multiple names, multiple spellings, um, multiple titles. So it's not as easy as just going to the Scripture and typing in, uh, you know, Jethro. I'm going to study him. You're going to have to read context, and you're going to have to study all around it and see if maybe he has, uh, you know, a diff different name in other places. You're going to have to figure all those things out. Uh, and an another problem that you're going to run into, let's say I'm studying Simon. Well, Simon, there's multiple Simons in the Bible. Uh, let's say I'm studying Judas, okay? Well, there are multiple Judases in the Bible. I, I've got to make sure I'm dealing with the right person. And sometimes a person lived in one age and, and then another person lived in a different age with the same name. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, that happens all around us, okay? Have you ever bumped into somebody with the same name as you? Of course you have. Have you ever known that somebody lived 100 years ago with maybe even your exact name, first and last. That's possible. Uh, so if you're going to study a person in the Scripture, you're going to have to do all that. You're going to have to uh, you know, figure out the different names, different spellings, different titles that the person might have. Uh, you're going to have to look maybe for the meaning of the name. Sometimes the, the Scripture itself will tell you. Right there in the context, you see this person was named this because. So that means it's extremely important. Is there significance to that person's name? What does it mean? Was the person's name changed? Jacob changed to Israel. Why? What does Jacob mean? What does Israel mean? What was the significance in that change? Um, did, uh, did Jesus ever you know, say, you're going to be called such and such? Did the apostles ever change anybody's name? 
Did the Lord ever change, you know, the Father ever change anybody's name? And if so, what, what does that mean? What does that tell me? How am I going to study this person's name and say, okay, well, this person's name was this, but then the Lord came along and said, I'm going to now call you this. Another thing is, was the person's name given before birth? Did the Lord say this person's going to be called this? All that's very interesting in your study of, of scripture. Uh, what titles are found? You know, are the titles descriptive? Meaning, do they say, okay, this person was a prophet or this person was a wine dresser or this person was a, um, you know, the, the son of Belial? Is it, is it a character thing? There are different things that are assigned to the person to be descriptive, to tell you, okay, this person, I think it was Amos that said, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was Amos said he was neither a prophet or the son of a prophet. Uh, that, that's, a, that's pretty good, okay? So what are the descriptive things said about this person and what, uh, what do you learn about that individual based on those? Um, was it necessary for the title to be given or was it just inserted for, for insight? So why were we told the, these things about the person? Uh, you might want to consider uh, words associated with the person, like uh, what interpretive statements are made about him or her, what, uh, who made these statements, uh, what are some important sayings or statements made by the person. So this person said this. I'll tell you this, one of the most difficult book, uh, books of the Bible to study, because we've got this right here, were these sayings true or false? Were they doctrinally correct? If you study uh, the book of Job, you have to understand that some of, things, some of the things, in fact, God himself st stated such, some of the things said by Job's friends were false. So you have to know, if I'm reading you know, chapter 15, who's, who's speaking in this chapter? Is what was said true or is it false? Is there an element of truth? And falsehood. What? What's? What's been? I have to compare this with other places in Scripture. I can't just say, "Well, this is in the Bible, so it's true." This is going to be a, a weird statement. I've made it before, and I always get nervous about making it. But if you can, if you don't understand what I'm going to say, you got to ask me. If you do understand what I'm getting ready to say, it will be eye-opening if you haven't already thought on it. Everything in the Bible is accurately recorded. Everything. But not everything in the Bible is true. Now, let me give you an example before you stress on me. The Bible accurately records the statements of Satan. But what Satan said is not necessarily true. So when I say everything in the Bible is accurately recorded, but not everything in the Bible is true, sometimes our heads want to explode on that because we want to say, no, 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 you can't say that. that you're saying the Bible is wrong. No, I'm, the Bible is right. But not everything that people said in the Bible was right. It's accurately recorded, and God gave us the historical record of their words but that doesn't mean what they were speaking was truth. There are multiple lies found in the pages of God's word. God accurately recorded it, but it, what was recorded, th those people were lying. Again, if, I, I, I'm nervous wreck saying such things. If you don't understand what I just said, I need you to ask me. And I'll, I'll try it again, and I'll reword things, and I'll, I'll give you a, another example. But please don't walk away from this class saying, man, we can't trust the Bible. No, that, that's not at all true. You can trust the Bible. But sometimes you can't trust the people who were speaking in the Bible. For example, uh, Satan. Just because Satan says something and God put it in the historical record of Scripture does not mean God was saying everything Satan is saying is true. Again, if, if that puzzles you or that stresses you or that shakes your faith, I need you to talk to me. I need you to ask me. 
because that is the last thing I want to do. I know that that is a, if you've never thought that, if you've never considered that, that can be, you know, a fearful thought. But, but I, I want you to talk to me and I want you to get it in the context of what I'm saying. I, I know how this stuff works on the internet and people pull clips and they pull stuff out of context. They say, well, this guy doesn't even believe the Bible. That's not true at all. I believe every word in this Bible is exactly what God wanted it to be. But sometimes God was just telling you the facts and the truth about what somebody else said. Okay, so if I'm studying the scripture and I'm studying the life of a person, I'm studying the life of Job, for example, and I have to consider what his friends were saying to him, were those things true or were they false? Were they doctrinally correct? Maybe, maybe not. I have to, I, I've got to be careful with that. Okay, if I'm studying a person, I, I need to consider the, the family ties. Uh, if I have the information, who is this person's father and mother? Who are this person's siblings? Does this person have any children? Did this person get married? Who are the, the close friends or companions? Uh, if this person's a prophet, I know this is not a family tie, but who else was a prophet at the same time? What was going on, you know, did they work together? Were they in different locations? But their ministry, you know, work together, but one's in Jerusalem, the other's in Babylon. I, I, I need to consider all those things. Um, how did the, the family or the close associations uh, impact that person's life? All those things are important details. And uh, we need to consider all the details of the person's life. So if I'm studying an, in, an individual... When, you know, where does, does, this, does the scripture record this person's birth? If so, where? What was going on? You know, what, what are the details of this? Does it record the, the person's death? Just because the scripture doesn't record somebody's birth wouldn't cause you to say, well, this person was never born. Well, if the person lived, the person was born. Just because the scripture doesn't record somebody's death wouldn't lead you to believe Okay, the person never died. Now, if the scripture records that the person never died, that's a different, that's a different story. I, I think the, the details of birth and death are extremely interesting in the life of Moses. Extremely interesting. Uh, phenomenal, actually. Uh, what's the location of this uh, person being found in scripture? What was going on at the time? What are the major events? Uh, those are all important things for you to understand. And then what are the person's strengths and weaknesses? M Moses, for example, the meekest man on the earth. So how is meekness a strength of Moses? Uh, what are what were some of his weaknesses? All those are, are great studies. And then you can study, was this person a type or foreshadowing of somebody else to come? Was the life of Joseph a type or a foreshadowing of the life of Jesus Christ? And uh, certainly the answer is yes on that. But you can consider all those things. Now again, depending on the person, if, I, if it's the life of David, if it's the life of Moses, if it's the life of Jesus, if it's the life of the Apostle Paul, um, a, a lot of these uh, folks, I'm going to be spending hours upon hours just taking in information. And you know what? I have to be willing to spend however much time studying a person and consider, I may never get to teach or preach on this person. I may spend all this time studying and just come to the conclusion that that was enjoyable for me, but I don't believe God would have me to teach on this, you know, concerning a, 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 in front of an audience. Maybe God's given it to me for a different purpose. Maybe it's just for me. Maybe it's just for me to learn and grow and become a better Christian. And I've got to be willing to invest 10 hours of time in a study that never gets heard by anybody else. It was just God working in my life. And you got to be okay with that. And if you're not, then um, you're not a very good student of the scripture. It's just true. Now, once I've 
taking in this information and I'm, you know, obviously I'm continuing to grow and learn as I'm, you know, for furthering my depth into this, into this person, I'm going to develop my outline. I might say the early years, the, you know, the, the, the latter years, I might say, uh, his ministry in this area, his ministry in this, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to develop my outline and then I'm going to, I'm going to get my information together and now I want to pass it on to somebody else. What is the purpose for teaching on this person? What's the theme? What's the purpose? Are there good character traits to be learned and applied? Man, look at the faith in this lady. What, what, what can I learn from this person? Are there bad character traits? Okay, so I'm, I see this good thing in this person and I'm gonna, I want to learn that and I want to apply it to my life. But then I see this bad character trait in this person's life and I, I want to learn it, but I want to learn it so that not, not that I can apply it and be the same, but I want to avoid it and not be like that person. What are the, the circumstances on, uh, uh, on the Bible character's life and the similarities that might be shared with those in the audience? One of the, one of the most enjoyable, I know this is going to sound strange, but one of the most enjoyable studies I ever did on a person was studying Judas Iscariot. If, you would, if we would just approach the scripture with an open mind on the study of Judas Iscariot, I'm convinced we would see a little bit of Judas Iscariot in all of us. Maybe a lot of Judas Iscariot in all of us. And when you, when you approach Judas as a human being, just like yourself, what was he looking for in life? What did he get out of that? What frustrated him? When did things go wrong? When did his heart turn? What, what do you see even after his heart turned to let you know that he was something was bothering him, all those things. But you have to help the audience to see we're studying Judas Iscariot. Yes, there are doctrinal implications in the life of Judas Iscariot. But if, you, if you're not careful, Judas represents what can happen in some ways, not in every way, but in some ways in your life if you get frustrated with the Lord or disenfranchised with the Lord or with his people. So I need to, I need to identify the circumstances in, in the, my Bible character's life that are similar to what's going on in the life of the audience. Okay, he was uh, brought up in this kind of home. You were brought up in this kind of home. He lived in this kind of a, 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 a place. You live in this kind of a place. He had these kind of emotions. You have these kind of emotions. It's crucial for the audience not to feel distanced from the person being studied. If the teacher hopes for the hearers to see why the, uh, this lesson is needed to be learned and applied. Why do you need to learn this? Well, you need to learn it because just like this was present in this guy's life, it's present in your life. You need to walk the, the audience through the person's life as though telling the story uh, of his or her, uh, you know, of his or her life. Uh, put the people in the time. Uh, show them the place. You know, walk them through these things. You can't spend much time on these things because you've got to stay focused on the person. But consider all the, how all these things work together to make this person who he or she uh, became. And then here, here's what I would say to you. Identify how God did use the person obviously in spite of this person or how God would have used this person had the person yielded. Why? Because I want my audience to see this person. You, the apostle Paul was used supernaturally by the Lord and we're not going to be apostles, but God in many ways, in so many ways could use you just like he used the apostle Paul if you were only yielded like the Apostle Paul was yielded. Sometimes we elevate the characters in the Bible. These people are like superheroes, right? They're superhumans. But they sometimes they were 
given supernatural powers by the Lord that maybe we wouldn't be given exactly. But we have the same spirit of God dwelling in us that the Apostle Paul had in him. We have a more completed Bible at, you know, at, at our hands, at our reach than the Apostle Paul had. We have access to the Father through the Son with the help of the Holy Ghost, just like the Apostle Paul did. So I want to show the audience, yeah, you're, you're, you're not looking for the supernatural gifts of healing. Yes, you're not looking for the, the supernatural gift of, of tongues. But even the Apostle Paul, toward the end of his ministry, he wasn't looking for those things. Those things seemed to be declining or, or out by the time the Apostle Paul completed his ministry. So I'm trying to show people this person in the Bible, God used him or her this way, and you can be used in that way. Or this person in the Bible could have been greatly used by the Lord. Jonah is one that comes to mind. Look how the book of Jonah ends. What a horrible thing. God, God used him and wanted to use him more, but Jonah just couldn't get his heart right. And so look how it ended. We don't want it to end like that. Look at the life of Demas. God used Demas, and God likely would have continued to use Demas, but Demas hath forsaken me, the Apostle Paul said, having loved this present uh, world. And so how could God have used this person if he or she had simply been yielded? So if I'm studying a person, I want to bring to, to people's attention, let, let's walk through the life. Let's tell the story of this individual. Here's what shaped this person into the man or woman that uh, he or she became. Here's what uh, character traits are here that are good that we ought to learn from. We ought to grow from and say, hey, I want to be more like that. Here are the traits that, we, that are exhibited in this person's life that we would say, I don't want to do that. But help the audience to see th themselves in the passage. And, and this is kind of the theme for where we've been up to this point. We're, we've looked at topical, you know, the topical approach to teaching the Bible. Okay, put people in the event. Put people in the life of the person as a spectator, watching this person, maybe even being this person. Uh, take people to this period of time and walk them through it. Uh, take people to the place, whatever it is. Walk people through these situations and help them to see themselves in the text so that they'll understand, wow, this is how this applies to my life. And if God will help me, I can take what happened 3,000 years ago and I can see how it's relevant to my life today and how it can change my eternity, how it can change my rewards or loss of rewards, how it can change my marriage, how it can change my relationship with my children or with my parents, how it can change my relationship on the job, how it can change my relationship with other people, how it can help me to be just a better Christian in general. But you gotta make it relevant to the people. I hope that this has been a help to you. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we will step into the textual study, the textual study. And uh, this is, again, this is for me, for me, this is a more fearful approach, topical approach. But if you do it true to the context, true to the Bible, and you, you can tell people the story of what took place and get them in the passage. It can be greatly used of the Lord and it can really, really help people. And there are so many doctrines and subjects of scripture that if you can do this, you are really gonna help people to get a more biblical worldview and a more biblical view just in their daily practical lives. And it would it fix a lot of sin. It fix a lot of separation. It fix a whole lot of things if we, we could do this in a scriptural way. So thank you so much for being with us, and uh, we look forward to next time. Thank you so much, and the Lord bless you as you uh, serve him and study his word this week. Take care.